So Deborah Stone wrote a 408 page book called The Policy Paradox. And you're being asked to write a book report that's six to seven double space pages. Now, re go ahead and read the directions. The directions have a lot of detail on the things that you should make sure that you cover. But one of the first things that you'll note is that you probably cannot uh, deal with policy paradox in the same detail, right? You might be used to taking an English course where you're reading a 20 stanza poem and you're writing a page about it and you say, well, you know, I'm writing 500 words or I'm writing a thousand words about a thousand word poem. Well, that makes a lot of sense, right? And then you can focus on what each sentence means. But I think when you're looking at an assignment where you're supposed to uh, analyze a 400 page book in six to seven pages, you're going to have to pick and choose what you think is most important. And I did this on purpose, really. One of the main reasons we aren't just taking a test on Stone is because I suspect that each student was going to find a somewhat different a view of the important parts of policy paradox uh, as it relates to uh, their own uh, interaction with policy analysis. So, you know, in policy analysis, we're doing a detailed examination of a public policy problem and we're selecting a policy and what we call an alternative to solve that problem. Well, Stone is going to uh, introduce us to the idea that it might not be possible to come up with a single best alternative that's the same for everyone, right? It's a conceit of what she calls the rationality project that there is a single best answer. And uh, I think that Stone wrote her book in large measure to make us look more at the way that the public's psychological approach or their, their values uh, tend to um, help us determine what uh, policies we should actually adopt. But I'll let you discover more as we move on in uh, this slideshow. One of the most important uh, things to remember is that Stone's book is meant to contrast with a different approach to policy analysis. In our course, uh, we're going to be looking at a modified view of this, uh, the, uh, the Bardock book. And Bardock is going to introduce us and, and, uh, and suggest to us a path for systematically analyzing public policy. Uh, Stone does not agree that there even is a possibility uh, to, uh, to systematically analyze policy from a neutral perspective. Uh, Bardock accepts the premise that the market, now he, he would say with the aid of, of government setting up systems that will tend to maximize the benefit to society, um, that the market can provide what society needs. Um, now, Stone does not begin with this premise. And in fact, a lot of what she does is she talks about the limitations and problems with this assumption. Um, whereas the rationality project, as she calls it, that's almost a slanderous term for uh, rational choice theory and the market-based approach to policy analysis. Um, that we're actually going to look at several articles and we're going to have many slides that are going to help us understand even a more pure view of, of uh, the rational choice model. But she's going to say, no, instead, we need some other alternative that's going to explain the way the world really works in terms of policy analysis. So here's our, our picture of the book. Um, if you have the second edition, uh, older versions of the second edition, say revised edition of Policy Paradox, 
uh, you really need to look for and to find the third edition. The third edition has a couple new chapters and updated examples, but also I would go so far as to say that she's reworded and reconceptualized some of her ideas in a much more full and complete way. So this is the book that we need to make sure that we have. Stone introduces us to this concept, this model of society, which she calls the polis. Now the polis is, is her, uh, as she gives it, uh, is a term taken from the Greek city-state. But her conceptualization of it is not ac the actual Greek city-state, but rather the smallest possible political community that still has all of the important aspects of democracy and uh, governmental structure and policies to be carried out and decisions to be made by a group. So for instance, a family would be too small and a family generally has certain figures within it, parents, who tend to have more power than the uh, other members of, the, uh, of that tiny political community. Um, instead, a polis, at least in theory, would have some ability to have a democratic system. Although, if you read Stone carefully, um, the idea of a democratic system can be of a greater or lesser extent. Um, there's no clear decision rules uh, that define necessary outcomes in the polis model. In the polis model, uh, we assume that that political community creates through the interrelationships of the people within the community, uh, their system of decision making. And we aren't, we aren't saying if the cost is higher or the benefit is higher, uh, we're going to make a particular decision. Instead, uh, people will come together and through consensus or through power, uh, we will determine uh, who wins and who loses. So Stone sees outcomes as a result of subject and conditional meanings that are found through joint interactions. Uh, at the furthest extent, if those of you who've taken uh, communications courses recognize this as being our entire language and our entire mode of interaction is through the agreement on what we're talking about, what we're, what's being conveyed, um, and who's doing the conveying of information. When you think about power within a political community, especially the way Stone thinks of it, Stone thinks of uh, public interest, a, a consensus of view, a general understanding within the community if that can exist, uh, of um, rather than uh, rather than the views of any individual or groups of individuals, so the rational choice theory says, well, what is best for the individual, and each individual will make an individual decision. But Stone says we are interested in what is of the general or societal interest. And how do we come about determining what that is, uh, especially because it's almost impossible to come up with unanimous decisions. So the market model says most of the time we're going to be able to trade between people who are willing to make the choice to trade. Uh, the, uh, uh, the polis model says most of the time people have interests and they have unequal abilities to make that interest uh, uh, be the public interest. Now, I'm not sure that there can even be a, such a thing as a public interest. At what point, it's certainly at some point, right, there could, be, uh, there could be some policy alternative that would benefit all of society to such a degree that even though a few people are being harmed, seriously harmed, unfairly harmed, that a democratic process might cause that harmed group to just suffer. 
Well, if that were true, if that were to happen, then is it the public interest? Or is it that the people who are being oppressed by a political community perhaps are not even uh, meaningfully members of that community? Uh, you, could, you could, although it would be somewhat circular, you could argue that it is not everyone determining the public interest. It is not the members determining the public interest, rather it's the public interest choosing the membership. Anybody who has tried to live in a gentrifying community or anybody who has ever tried uh, to uh, own a business in a community that is perhaps not uh, desirous of having that business in the community realizes that, that their membership is rather conditional. And furthermore, quite often, everyone acting in their own best interest does not come up and result in the best interest to everyone or to the most people. Um, you, you do not, especially in the polis model, always have the uh, best outcome for society determined by each person seeking their best alternative. Uh, when when the individual, uh, when the collect, when the aggregate of everyone's individual best interest is not the same as the best interest of the entire group. Um, when person A plus person B plus person C's interest does not include, does not equal to the public interest, then you have what's called a collective action problem. Probably the most famous collective action problem is the free rider. Uh, the free rider uh, is an example of when one person benefits without having to pay the cost of a collective action. We'll talk about that a little more in a second. Stone also talks a great deal about the concept of ambiguity. Ambiguity or the idea of people not knowing exactly the meaning of a public policy uh, aids in policymaking by allowing policymakers to focus on compromise. If we've all spelled out precisely what we want and we have the same ideas of what each word in a contract or in an agreement or understanding uh, means, then it becomes much more difficult for both sides to feel that they have had their interests um, attended to. Uh, rather, when it's possible to have like certain words, Stone talks about things like liberty and equality, or rather, she talks about equity. Uh, when, when she does, um, one of the things you probably know is that we don't agree in particular what we mean by things like liberty. We're all for liberty. You will find almost nobody who will ever say, I am personally against my own liberty. In fact, you'll rarely see people who say, I'm against you having liberty. However, that everybody defines liberty in such a way as to maximize their own benefit from it. So if, if I can say liberty, if I can say I'm all for liberty and you can say you're all for liberty, and then we don't have to hash out exactly what we mean until we make that agreement, well, it's certainly going to make compromise easier. Um, the devil is in the details, right? Um, so agreeing to work together is easy if the framework can be accepted. And then once we have a framework, then we'll work out the details. It's always, it's, 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 it's always easier to, to compromise once you feel that the most important decisions have already been made. So a uh, fun little cartoon I found here. It's so sweet. He wrote me a letter, and I think here in paragraph eight, he's asking me out. Well, maybe maybe if, 
if generally speaking you want to be asked out, right? But wouldn't the perfect letter be one that causes all people who wish to be asked out to feel like they've been asked out and all the people who wish not to be asked out to feel as though only most pro the most proper letter has been sent them. Uh, we usually think of ambiguity as bad, but whether we think of it as bad depends on, you know, on, on what those ladies were wanted, what the two people who are debating equity want, whether, uh, you know, whether you think that your business is looking out for you or whether you think that it is looking out for itself, well, it's okay to believe whatever you want. Um, and it's much better if you feel attached to where you're working, right? Um, and so if every day is an endless debate over exactly who gets what percentage of what, um, that's that's uh, perhaps why that we have small print, right? And if we uh, if everything was in large print, it would be a lot more difficult for us to uh, come to agreements. Besides, a lot of people, a lot of people, what, what do we say? We're we're big picture people, which means eh, we'll hash out the details, and we don't mind if in the particulars it doesn't set, it isn't as good as it sounds, just so it's good enough. I told you we'd come back to the free rider problem. So rational choice theory tends to view free riders as rare problems. We talk about the prisoner's dilemma. We talk about the chicken game. We talk about, you know, we, 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 we talk about stalemates and stag hunts. And there's these particular specific examples of when uh, individual best interest and collective best interest is not the same. But we know, of course, that quite often there's very few there, there's there's very few goods that one person's overuse of it won't cause harm to others, right? The tragedy of the commons is a very famous collective action problem where a few people determine that they can do better by overusing a resource that's essentially free to everyone. And if a few people overuse that resource, then it will run out for the other people. One of the examples that you don't really get if you're from Ohio like me, um, but you notice when you move down here to Georgia, is the idea of, of water, right? Water is extremely cheap. Nobody is ever going to go broke if the only water they use is the water that they get out of the uh, faucet at home and they use it to and, and you know they use it to drink water uh, on the other hand if somebody is watering their lawn and yeah, one person watering their lawn is not going to hurt anybody but let's say it's a drought and let's say that in a subdivision everybody decides having a green having green grass is better well it would be possible, certainly in some of these Georgia communities, for, for the water to run out. And then the things you need water for, like drinking and doing laundry and such. Um, I've seen this problem in Kern County, California, that, that they actually run out of water and they have to truck it in. And people have a limited amount of water and they, they use, they, they have to pour like a gallon of water down uh, the commode when they go to the bathroom and they have to and, and they have to wash their dishes in water that they go and they drive several miles to pick up in the United States. And ultimately, ultimately, if you look really close at it, this is a public policy decision. They get most of their water, uh, they get most of their water stored underground and it turns out that it's used to promote farming in the community and not to promote people in the community. Well, that, that could be viewed as a tragedy of the commons. California would be a wonderful place for about half as many people as live in California to live. And so Georgia, California, if it doesn't, if you, if you use more water, um, 
or you use enough water that any one person's use of it can affect the amount available to everyone else, you quickly see that collective action problems are, are, are real and common. Because, you know, a green, a green lawn is actually a wonderful thing, but not if it causes somebody else to not have drinking water. Now, a couple other ideas from Stone. So Stone divides her book into four sections. First, she talks about the market and the polis. Then she talks about goals. And, and for her, goals are the things that we view as good things for society. Then she talks about problems. And in, when she's talking about problems, in many ways, she's talking about ways that we define uh, problems. For instance, she talks about symbols and she talks about numbers. And what are numbers ultimately, but scores that we ascribe to different levels of scarcity or plenty. Then she talks about solutions or mechanisms that can be designed to cause certain things to happen or to at least explain how we're going to try to solve problems. And she says each of these are conditional and have different meanings for each person. Uh, now, that might be an overstatement. Maybe they have different meanings for various groups of people. So finally, we'll finish with uh, a few things that you should look at as you're reading the Stone book. First of all, you need to consider the competing definitions. And I, and I would actually take notes here where I would decide what she says, what the rationality project says, and what you believe. And it's okay to disagree with Stone. It's okay to agree with Stone. But it's probably not okay to read Stone and not interrogate her words or or your beliefs with her words or her words with your beliefs. But there needs to be an interaction there where you determine what exactly you believe to be true. Sec third, um, how does ambiguity help lead to policy outcomes? I think as you read, you're going to see that Almost every phrase she uses, she uses, and now she does this on purpose. She uses the words from her book in ways that are different from the way other people use the words. It's not quite like watching a clockwork orange and having to figure out all the different strange words that they use. Um, instead, instead, what we're what we're saying is. There's different ways to think about equity. There's different ways to think about uh, rules. There's different ways to think about rights. There's different ways to think about policy making. And so as you do, as you read the book, let, let what she says interact with what you've believed in the past. Um, and then you have to uh, draw your own conclusions and hopefully you can utilize these both to write a good book report, but more importantly, to inform your future understanding of how public policy works. So once we move on to, I guess, module four, we're, we're going to start actually learning a great deal about what is meant by rational choice theory. Um, but for right now, for right now, I think we maybe should give Stone a head start and you should get reading uh, the reading the policy paradox and uh, and trying to formulate some understanding from it. Thanks.